Welcome into the Ether, a podcast focusing on all things Ethereum, the leading blockchain for decentralized applications. I'm Eric Connor, your host and founder of ETHUB, a decentralized information hub for Ethereum. Into the Ether features deep dives on topics with prominent guests in the community, as well as ETHUB weekly recaps featuring Anthony Sassano. Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Ether. Today, I have Rune Christensen, founder and CEO of Maker on the podcast. Maker is currently the most popular dApp built on Ethereum and was clearly, in my mind, the catalyst for the recent open finance movement. Thanks a lot for joining me today, Rune. Glad to be here, man. Thanks. Um, so I always like to kind of start off and ask my guests how they got involved with Ethereum to begin with. I know you've been around for a long time, but kind of what is your story and how did you get involved with Ethereum? Yeah, I started off as a really like an early adopter of Bitcoin back in 2011. Um, and what actually happened was that at some point I plunged my life savings into Bitcoin and you know, went through kind of the whole cycle of a bubble, right? So I saw my, my, you know, my net worth dramatically increase. And then as I, you know, held on all the way down to the bottom, I lost all the money again through the, you know, and, and really like felt, you know, felt the impact of volatility uh, on myself. And, and through that, I realized that you really need stability in this space before real people are going to use it, right? Like, regular people are not going to be able to deal with that kind of, of, of volatility and the extreme uh, price swings. So I actually got into BitShares initially because that was the first solution to the, the stability problem as they invented the very first stable point. And as, as BitShares failed to really get traction, I then finally uh, you know, focused my attention on Ethereum as th- that was really you know, um, getting getting more traction around the, the end of 2014 and ultimately decided that Ethereum was really the perfect place to try to actually create a stable coin, right? And a proper um, a proper ecosystem of, of stable cryptocurrency that would then finally see blockchain technology becoming available for real use in the real world. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I was going to ask you if you had the vision uh, for Maker kind of before you even heard about Ethereum, and it sounds like you definitely did. And I mean, I think we're all going through a period of high volatility over the last few months. I mean, we ha- of course had another huge bubble, and then a burst of the bubble, and you know, down ninety percent. I think you know the launch of Dai around that time. I mean, first of all, it was amazing to see how stable it stayed through the crash, and we'll, we'll get into that as well. But I think it really kind of opened people's eyes to, hey, if we're going to go mainstream here, like a lot of us might not mind holding ether and the volatility that's related to it and bitcoin as well but to really go mainstream people are going to want that stable coin to hold on to at least for a decent amount of their portfolio yeah absolutely i mean and especially in terms of of you know building apps that are just apps for some real world issue right like let's say something like like a remittance app or some sort of accounting system or anything like that i mean at that point people don't even want to know that there is blockchain or cryptocurrency under the hood. They just want to see US dollars, right? And then they want to save and want to get better user experience because of the efficiency and speed of blockchain. So, I mean, so that's kind of the other side of it, right? Like you need a stable coin to be able to really hide the complicated blockchain details down in the machinery and really just, you know, show people the simple version when they actually interact with it. Yeah, definitely. I fully agree with that. Most people just want to see US dollars, right? That's what they're used to. And at least for the next, you know, five, 10 years or whatever, as people are still getting comfortable with crypto, it's going to be a necessity. Um, so I, I think that's a good background. I'd like to transition into Maker and then obviously talk about DAI and CDPs. As I mentioned in the intro, this is definitely, I mean, it has to be the most used app on Ethereum right now. Uh, there's over 2 million Ether locked in the contracts in total, at least last I checked about a week or two weeks ago. And I'm sure most of the listeners have heard of Maker and DAI, but can you just give kind of a quick overview on how the system works? Uh, um, and then also the importance of the maker token and kind of how Dai is created. Uh, like very simply, right? Dai is the stablecoin that exists for regular users to be able to use blockchain and crypto without having to really worry about volatility or advanced blockchain details. Um, but sort of Dai is really just the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, you can say sort of the the other side of the coin 
uh, is this whole mechanism that backs the stability of that, which is really the, 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 the entirety of the, of the maker system. And um, you could say the first layer or sort of the most fundamental um, aspect of the system that, that backs the stability of DAI is the collateralized lending. Um, so the CDPs, right? The collateralized debt positions that enable people to lock up collateral, post-collateral into the decentralized smart contract system and use that to actually borrow DAI. Um, and the, the key rule is that to borrow DAI from the maker system, you must put in an excess of collateral, right? So you must put in, let's say, $200 worth of Ethereum, and you can then use that to borrow 100 DAI. And you can then go and spend that 100 DAI on, it can be different things, right? Some people have, have made like these big loans to, to actually purchase cars or finance their business or something like that. Others have, uh, I mean, a more standard use case is you just buy even more Ethereum. So you use the system as a way to uh, get leveraged exposure to Ethereum. Um, and all of this then results in DAI on one hand being this very simple, very easy to use stable coin, right? That anyone can use to um, like to use crypto without the downside of the volatility. It's actually very easy to use. You know, you can, it works just like Bitcoin, except it's, it's stable and at $1. Uh, and you don't need to worry about all the complicated stuff. Like you don't need to worry about CDPs or Maker or any of that to use DAI. And that's really what most people who use it, like that's how they use it, right? They don't go deeper than that. Just like you don't need to know how the Federal Reserve works in order to use uh, USD cash bills, right? Um, but that advanced component of the CDPs and the underlying stability and all of that does have to exist, right? Because there must be a very strong guarantee in the system that ultimately there is more value in collateral than there is DAI in circulation, right? Like, so for instance, today there is something like 92 million DAI in circulation and that is backed by around, yeah, something like 250 to, to $300 million worth of Ethereum tokens as collateral. So ultimately that really ensures this very high um, level of over collateralization, right? That guarantees that even in the event of a crash in Ethereum, or something like what we saw, you know, all of, of last year, right? Like a slow, uh, but but very um, persistent crash over a long period of time. Even despite that kind of volatility in the collateral, DAI remains stable throughout this. And ultimately, the way that is ensured is through um, the maker governance and the MKR token. So the MKR token is the governance token of the system. And ultimately, it actually votes directly in the system to set the rules of the game, essentially. Um, it, it regulates what the terms and the parameters that people who deposit collateral like ETH into the system, what kind of loans they can then get. Um, and, and that has to be regulated in a way that ensures that on one hand, you know, the system is as efficient as possible and doesn't just extract rent from its users, right? But actually is, is meant to, to serve the user and give them the best possible conditions. But also at the same time, keeps the whole system stable and, and safe, right? In the sense that there is enough collateral requirements and there is enough over collateralization to, to make sure that the system can withstand even the most significant um, shock and impact to the, to the collateral. Um, so that's how all of these different parts fit together. And ultimately it's kind of like, depending on who you are, you can decide how deep you want to go, right? Most people, they don't really worry about anything other than just die and just using die. And ultimately they can just look at the track record of the system, right? And see that it has remained stable for more than a year at this point. Um, the more advanced users, they actually use the CDPs and actually borrow from the system. Um, and ultimately the real, like those who really want to go deep and really want to be specialists and actually be a part of governing the system itself, they get into MKR and so the end-to-end um, you know, uh, complex complexities of, of actually governing and, and managing the risk of the system.
Yeah, I, I think that's a great explanation and kind of covers all the aspects. And I guess the most important part there is that every die is backed by or it's over collateralized. So if you if you want to escape to stability from the volatility of ether, you can go and lock up you know a hundred dollars worth of ether and you can draw down maybe whatever you want fifty dollars worth of die. So that's backed by collateral that protects it, and that's why it can. Well, there's a lot of mechanisms of how it keeps stability, but that's essentially why um, you know it's backed and it can. Stay stable so it's obviously i i think cdps have been live like it hasn't been a year over a year now um but to this point you've only been able to use ether as collateral and i know that your team's embarking soon on multi-collateral die and has been talking about it for a very long time can you kind of walk us through how this is going to work like what are the different assets that people are going to be able to use and this is for people that you know want to use tokens other than ether to create die yeah, so the current version of the system, which we call single collateral die, is really just a technical beta that's there to kind of like act as a proof of concept that, that this kind of stuff is possible and, you know, like bootstrap the initial ecosystem around the system. Uh, but ultimately, the whole innovation of Maker and die and, and the promise of it is this ability to use multiple types of collateral in the system. Because that is how you actually get real, scalable, and, and long-term sustainable stability. And ultimately are able to build something that can have an impact in the real world and offer a, you know, a very compelling alternative to traditional finance. Um, so, I mean, like you're saying, we've been working on this for a very long time. In fact, we've been working on multi-collateral for much longer than we worked on single collateral. Um, you know, the, the, I mean, the project really started very late 2014 uh, so it's more than, than than four years right that that we've been working on this um, and where we are now is I would guess in, you know in the very very end of the launch phase right so everything is pretty much done I mean all the code is there um, except some few um, you know a few components and like a very a few details of the of the system. Uh, most of the security work has been done, right? Like, and and what we're doing now is just like this endless testing, endless like live um, environments, and 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 like you know making sure everything fits together, and and all of the components and all of the aspects that go into actually having a successful launch. Um, that involves you know upgrading everyone who's currently using single collateral die into multi collateral die, for instance. Um, as well as just like a whole lot, you know, like upgrading all our partners, getting everything, but getting it all to run smoothly. Um, that's kind of where we're at now, right? Like preparing for that very last step of actually doing the launch itself. And in terms of a timeline, I mean, we don't know exactly when it's going to be possible to launch because it's kind of hard to predict something like, um, you know, outcomes of security audits, right? And um, and just like the timeline for for, for like last mile polishing. Uh, but it's definitely coming very soon, right? And and I'm confident it'll be this year, um, and hopefully sooner rather than later. And yeah, so and 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 like I was saying, right, the transition will really be just an upgrade, right? So people who who hold um, like people who hold MKR, they will not have to do anything; they'll just be transitioned over automatically. Uh, they will have to vote for the the upgrade itself, though. People who hold DAI will be presented with basically a button they have to click to upgrade their DAI from single collateral DAI to multi collateral DAI. And the same goes for CDP users. So you have to kind of like upgrade your CDP. Um, and then the result will be that like things should, you know, the system should just really significantly improve, right? Like liquidity will get better because there's more collateral types, the stability will get better as well. Um, there'll be new use cases in terms of now you can add new collateral into the system and, and also for sort of the governance of the system, there'll be this whole new, uh, universe of complex governance decisions that has to be made around what kind of collateral will be added to the system. Um, which is something that we've only recently started to really get traction on and really get momentum on in terms of having this fully decentralized governance process of MKR holders from around the world actually directly you know participating and ultimately controlling the governance of the system
Nice. Yeah. So are there going to be any default collateral types out of the box or is everyone going to have to be voted on? And then kind of on that same point, do you worry at all about maybe more illiquid collateral types being added and and adding risk to the system or what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. So there's no, I mean, um, ultimately MKR holders have to vote in collateral, right? So there's no such thing as default collateral. I guess other than ETH, it's just obviously going to be added, right? Because it's currently supported. Um, on the other hand, you could say everything is default collateral because really the approach is not really whether something will be collateral or not. It's what are the risk parameters going to be, right? It's going to be like, um, like, like what kind of, of, of interest rate and what kind of over collateralization will you need for whatever coin you want to use in the system? Um, only like what I would call complete scams and just like completely obviously worthless stuff will not be added at all. But pretty much everything else, like if there's actually some legitimate value there, um, there's really no limit to what kind of assets will be added. As long as the governance process, you know, has has the bandwidth to actually include it, right? So um, obviously there's going to be a lot of prioritization in terms of, of what will be added first. Um, and there's also just like technical barriers in terms of, again, like what will, what will we be able from a technical perspective to be able to include? Um, but yeah, ultimately, um, it's going to be up to MKR holders and the, the initial scope will be top ERC20 tokens, right? Because those are the ones that are the simplest to add from the, from the, from the technical perspective. And as a result, that's, what's going to be available to choose from at launch of MCD, right? Because the more the more complicated stuff, like for instance, centralized stable coins or security tokens, there like there's a ne- another layer of, of technical complexity that has to be built first before before those can be added. But sort of straight up, um, what I would call pure ERC twenty tokens, like something like Augur, Rep, or you know, a week ago, which we did actually announce in the past that we were going to consider as collateral. Um, those those are a lot simpler to add because they're just a basic ERC twenty token. They're they're really no different than adding Ethereum from the technical perspective. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you you definitely want to make sure, or I guess maker holders need to make sure, right, that the collateral they're adding has enough demand if something's liquidated. I, I guess for those maybe not aware, if your collateralization ratio slips below one hundred and fifty percent, so say you that example earlier, you you wanted to pull out fifty die and you collateralize the hundred dollars worth of ETH. Um, if Ether price slips below the collateralization ratio, your position essentially is going to be margin called, um, and then people are going to have to buy your your ether on the market um, to kind of cover your debt position. So, you know, uh, that obviously has to be somewhat of a concern, right? For maybe some of these, I mean, once you get past maybe the top five or so top ERCs, it probably shouldn't be a worry. Um, but what are your thoughts there? Like, how do you offset that? Is it that you think uh, it's going to be voted that the collateralization ratio is just maybe higher than 150%? Well, yeah. So, I mean, how to actually approach that is it already gets quite advanced uh, in terms of, of how you deal with this this kind of, of uh, dilemma from a risk management perspective. But I guess the very short answer is that you just make sure that the um, like the less liquidity there is in an asset, the less of that asset you want to have in the portfolio, right? And then there's various ways you can you can um, you can control that. One very obvious way is using what's called the debt ceiling, which really just puts a cap to how much of a particular uh, asset there can be debt in a system backed by that, right? So you could say, we will not allow more than 20 million DAI to be generated um, that's backed by Omitigo, right? Something like that, right? Because we that's the absolute maximum we would, we, you know, we, we, we think the market can absorb. Um, or something, you know, like that's kind of how you would reason about this, right? Of course, in reality, it's, you know, you kind of want to have something that's a little bit more sophisticated than just some maximum cap, right? Um, yeah, but you know, that's something that, that like initially we'll start off with a relatively simple model, but ultimately we do have like highly, highly sophisticated models for the stuff that are, you know, that are basically based off traditional risk management. So how you do this in the real world with when banks, for instance, uh, you know, give portfolio margin and and uh, just relying on all the you know the historical and, and sort of the scientific basis there is um, behind you know just this advanced field of of uh, risk management. Um, 
And, and yeah, so that ultimately gets us back to what I was saying earlier, right? That in the end, you can pretty much include anything. You just have to make sure you include it on the right terms, right? And you manage it correctly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the, the cap's a good point. I mean, you guys, when you launched, you had a smaller cap on die that can be created from Ether than that we're at now. And we're actually almost up on the ceiling again. I think we're, is it like 8 million die away or something like that? Um, and, you know, on that point, there's been a lot of discussion recently about a die and kind of slipping below its peg a little bit. Mainly, I think I was observing this on Coinbase where the price first USDC fell, I think, to around like 97 cents or so. Um, and the reaction to that is, a mechanism in, in the governance process that's called uh, the the maintenance fee for CDP. So basically, um, it was raised to three point five percent. So if you think of it in a typical loan term, you're kind of if you're taking out a CDP, you're ha- having to pay interest on that. Um, it was it's kind of moved around a little bit. It was at 0.5 at a point, and now it's been moved up to three point five. Um, and this was a measure to kind of get that peg back into place. Is that right? And can you kind of explain to people why how this mechanism works to float the peg? back to one yeah so the stability of dies fundamentally like i mean the long-term stability of die is backed by the collateral in the system right that's why that's how you know die isn't worthless because you know that all that collateral is sitting there so you're you know there is enough collateral in the system to back the value of your die but the way to to you know the way to target the market price of die right so actually ensure that die really does trade around one dollar in the marketplace um, you know, has to, you know, that, that is actually a more like that's, that's sort of a whole problem in of itself. Right. And the way we approach that is through interest rate adjustments. So really it's about using some of the most basic microeconomic theory to change the incentives for either uh, adding demand to the system or adding supply to the system. Right. And so the basic, so, so right now, um, what we do is we adjust the stability fees in the system and the stability fees are actually only applied to CDPs. So they're only applied to the, the demand, uh, sorry, the supply function in the system. Um, and later we'll actually upgrade that in, in multilateral dial, we upgrade it to the die savings rate, which actually affects both demand and supply because it also affects those who hold die and gives them an interest rate. But right now we're only, uh, the system only supports changing the incentives for the CDP holders and thus changing the supply in the system. So essentially what the goal is to do is to make sure that the aggregate supply in the system more or less is balanced out by the aggregate demand, right? So, so basically that for every for every person who wants to buy die at $1, there's a person who also wants to sell die at $1, right? And what happens if there's too much on either side, right? So let's say there's too many people who want to sell die. What ends up happening is, you know, like, uh, you know, kind of like supply and demand and, uh, you know, just like the you know, like fundamental incentives kind of step in and mean that people would now start to sell die below $1 potentially, right? If there's just too much supply and not enough demand. Um, and then what you have to do is you have to modify the incentives so that you will actually be able to decrease supply and as a result, get it more in line with demand. And this is where the stability fee comes in, right? The rate for borrowing from the system, because the higher you set that rate, the less attractive it'll be to borrow out of the system. And then, yeah, like you said, right, we recently uh, like suffered more, like more, really more volatility than we've seen um, pretty much at any point in time, um, which was caused by a combination of very low interest rate in the system, right? A very low stability fee, uh, plus the fact that there's this new, like renewed, at least um, sideways sentiment in the market rather than a, 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 a you know, consistent bearish trend over time. Um, and those, those two factors combined meant that suddenly the die supply just exploded. Um, and then the governance has been playing catch up and has been really incre- been, been steadily increasing the stability fee to try to to balance out the supply right and, and get the supply more in line with demand um and uh, i think what we've seen now is that there's been some effect finally from this recent increase we did where we actually jacked it up by by two percent in one uh, in one adjustment uh, but i also think that overall is it still just like you know there's still more more room to go to, to a large extent right because there's actually a lot of like there's a lot of factors that play into this and not just the price in the market but also like the overall conditions of liquidity 
Um, and um, I mean, more than anything else, this has been a really incredible kind of like live, um, you know, lesson of how the, the system is supposed to work and the governance around the system. And especially been a lesson in what happens if the governance doesn't react fast enough, right? And also, ultimately, uh, kind of a, a reinforcement of the, the very basic assumption that the system, such as microeconomics, actually does work, right? You can, in fact, uh, manipulate market price by manipulating the incentives around supply and demand. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like all in all, um, the governance process is very likely to be able to handle this kind of issue much better in the future, right? Because it's really only been, been bootstrapped very recently and, and gotten started very recently. So um, overall, I think it's really exciting. I mean, there's really in general so much excitement around the governance process and, and, uh, and, and like all sorts of, like, you know, we have reporters from Coindesk, for instance, sitting in on the meetings now and, and reporting on them in real time. Which I just think is, is really cool, right? And it's sort of a new um, dimension to to just like how transparent and how decentralized this system is meant to be. Do you think that over time the process will become more efficient and faster? Not necessarily automated, but you know, almost to a point where it can react faster. And do you think multi collateral die will? add like how do you envision the governance system working efficiently when you're having to manage say five or ten different um stability fees um yes yeah, so, i mean i definitely think that it's going to like i think in the long run it'll be essentially a, a highly overseen and highly uh you know yeah like highly managed but ultimately automatic process right where you have people at all times kind of like overseeing and watching this automatic uh, system that, that, that gets as much data as possible um, that has already been agreed on by the governance, processes that data with the cutting edge algorithms that we have for it, and then ultimately reacts in direct, like as, as close to real time as possible to, um, to the dynamics in the market. Right. Um, but that's very far in the future, right? In the short run, I think we will just we will achieve incredible efficiency and liquidity and stability just by getting good enough at at um, controlling the the process that we 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 look you know that we're preparing to have at uh, at launch of multilateral die, which is a, like just one adjustment every week, right? So every week we'll just like process the changes in the market dynamics and then almost always do some sort of adjustment. And then, of course, in a few cases when really the market conditions is exactly the same as they were the, the week before, make no change. But just in general, always try to make a bit of an adjustment based on the data we're seeing, right? I think through that, we'll already already like be able to really achieve some, some quite incredible um, efficiency of monetary policy if it's also combined with a lot of different collateral. Gotcha. Yeah, that's interesting about adjusting it weekly. Do all of those require governance votes, or is that something that's built in automatically to the system? Yeah. So in in uh, multilateral DAI, um, you know, first of all, we'll have the DAI savings rate, right? So we'll have a mechanism that actually both manipulates the incentives to generate supply in the system, but also to uh, demand um, holding DAI, right? Because you'll actually be able to take your die and deposit it into uh, the die savings contract, which will then give you a, you know, a very modest, very um, like low risk, low return, um, you know, savings rate on your die over time, right? And and this then means that when we want to change, like if the let's say the price is too low of die, right? This means that when we when we change the die savings rate, we're both going to get more demand. We're both going to get more people in who want to hold die because the die savings rate is higher. So suddenly it looks more con- attractive compared to alternatives such as bonds or something like that. But at the same time, uh, increasing the die savings rate is also going to increase, uh, you know, the fundamental interest rate of of all the different CDPs in the system. So it'll also affect supply, right? So we'll have this double effect of both reducing supply and increasing demand when the price is too low, bringing it more closer to the peg, right? And and the same effect, but in reverse, if the price is too high, where we can actually decrease demand and increase supply simultaneously. And um, 
this will then have it like this will mean that we will need much smaller adjustments to have a much stronger effect um and then yeah like you were saying that this will be done through like i would call it like an kind of like a shortcut mechanism right so we don't have to go through the very elaborate governance process but rather what we do is we have the governance process essentially approve uh, a, a mechanism that creates this this shortcut that then allows the governors who want to participate in in the stabilization to then um, operate within a more restricted framework where you don't need to have as much people participating um, but then also there's no risk that they can just go in and like change like you know make huge adjustments to the savings rate or something right there'll be this like very uh, very strict predetermined um, you know window within where changes can be made within right it'll be very easy to undo any sort of attacks or any sort of of uh, bad behavior used against this mechanism gotcha i'm personally really excited for the die savings rate i mean it, to be able to earn interest on die that you hold first of all it's going to add a very essential component to the system but just from a user perspective will will be nice to kind of you know have a savings account type thing out there what what's your hunch on i know it's very probably an unfair question, but where's your hunch on kind of where that die savings rate will be? I guess if you took like maybe today's market condition, what do you what do you think that'll look like interest rate wise? Uh, I mean, yeah, that that is really hard to predict, right? But I think I think um, like a kind of like a, a hunch that I have is that you would end up with a die savings rate that was about half of the current stability fee, right? Because you have this double effect. So instead of needing to have a stability fee of, let's say, 4%, if, if you have the savings rate where you actually are both affecting supply and demand, it would maybe only need to be 2% because you also have a 2% effect on the demand side. Um, but it's actually, it's, it's literally impossible to predict. Like, I mean, this is such like advanced and sort of uh, a new frontier of, of macroeconomics, right? That like, we have no way of knowing other than just seeing how it plays out in real life. And I would also say that in general, it's going to to be very volatile in the early days, right? As the system um, is just getting started and new collateral is getting added and it's just like growing at a steady pace, but still it's very small in the grand scheme of things. There, there's going to be significant volatility in the savings rate and, and the general rates in the system as, as governance just like learns the ropes, right? And, and gets better at, at controlling the system. But over the very long term, um, the rates should really equilibrate with essentially the global um, interest rate regimes, right? So you would have the the the, sa- the die savings rate for the U.S. dollar pick die, you know, and landing around the interest rate for U.S. dollars, right? And and in general, that's how it will play out because ultimately it's an arbitrage opportunity, right? So if if the die savings rate is significantly higher than the rest of the global economy, you'll just have you know people shifting over their assets into die until the interest rate goes down. Yeah, makes sense. So it'll be, I think that's going to be a very highly used product. I think a lot of people are learning to, or wanting to earn interest on there. And of course, it's going to depend on the supply and demand, but a lot of people are wanting to earn steady interest on on their crypto. And you can do it on Compound. I think that's around 3% for DAI right now, but um, kind of being built into the maker system is going to be powerful. We've talked about governance a lot. I, I personally think you know, governance is very early um, on blockchain systems. It's going to kind of take years for us to fully figure it out. What's kind of your take on how the systems work so far? I mean, I guess one of my biggest things I see, there's very low voter turnout and apathy. It seems to me like voters kind of just follow the suggestions of the teams um, that the, for the suggestions that they put out. Um, do you kind of see this changing over time? Or what do you think the solutions are to kind of getting this voter apathy to turn around? Yeah, so when we when we when we designed the maker governance system, we we predicted that voter apathy would exist, right? And in the end, we've ultimately like the, the other like the other part of the story is that we don't even really think that voter sentiment is that important in terms of, of making decisions, right? Because what we want with maker is a system that is governed to be optimally stable, right? And and work as best as it possibly can for the users. Um, and that is actually not necessarily uh, completely aligned with, um, you know, what MKR holders would choose if they just got to choose whatever is best for them, right? Like if you if you really made it what I call the, the choose your own adventure style of governance, where it's really just a popularity contest of whatever people want to vote for, right? So what we've actually focused heavily on with maker governance is to 
um, essentially just look at MKR and, and on-chain voting more of a security mechanism, and maybe even you could say an oracle mechanism that um, ultimately votes through what has been agreed upon in the in sort of the, the the higher layer of the governance process, which is the social layer, right? Like the actual discussion around like what is it we want to achieve and and how do we achieve it and what's the data and what's the models and what's the theory that supports what we want to do, right? So that is what I think we are incredibly advanced at and, and doing incredibly well at with Maker, right? So we have these uh, weekly governance meetings with just a huge turnout, right? Incredible uh, participation of, of really of like experts from all around the world, right? And in particular, we have things like institutional stakeholders, right? So hedge funds um, and, and other types of institu- institutions, right, that, that, are, that have that have bought MKR and then as a result, they're incentivized to really participate in this process of, of, you know, deciding and and collaborating on really doing the optimal governance of the system. Um, And as a result, we we are in this situation where it's not, I mean, what that means is that it's not the team, for instance, it's not the foundation that decides what, um, you know, what the governance community is going to vote on. It is really the governance community that, together as a, as a group, right, makes that decision on its own. Um, and we have the whole framework for this. We call it scientific governance, right? So the goal is to use the scientific method as much as possible to ultimately re- achieve scientific consensus, right, which means a consensus primarily of, you know, highly informed experts, right, um, or like the closest to consensus you can get of that. And then ultimately you go with that decision because that's, the, you know, the best choice is to, to um, rely on, on, you know, on, on evidence and facts and data, right? And use that to, to guide your decision-making. And then MKR holders, their role is really just voting that through, right? Um, of course, there's also ways, I mean, you can get, you get kind of like sentiment and, and data and, and input out of MKR holders. But ultimately, like I was saying, right, it, we don't want it to be a popularity contest. We don't want it to be just, like whatever, you know, whatever coins that some big MKR holder has will just get the best risk parameters because, you know, he's incentivized to vote for that, right? We want to make sure that there's some sort of objective framework that ultimately um, provides the reason for why the risk parameters and the, the, you know, the terms of the system are the way they are, right? It can't just be arbitrary. Yeah, I think that's very important. I mean, just a single coin vote to control the system, you know, you're going to get whales manipulating and all that. So you need to add some more to it. So that's very interesting to hear you say, you said uh, scientific governance. Um, so what what happens, I guess, if just imagine the the peg was down at 9.6 still or 0.96 still, and, you know, the stability fee was not up at three and a half, or maybe we even raised it to three and a half and it didn't fix it. It needs to go to seven. And, and a vote goes on and maker holders vote against it. Um, and maybe the your team or the foundation or whoever it might be um, thinks that that can put the system at risk. And maybe that's a bad example, but just imagine a proposal passes where it could put the system at risk. Um, is there any way for, or what would happen at that point? Well, so... Um... I think so. Better example here, like to just put it more on the edge, right, is to talk about a tax, right? Because um, I, I do exp- me like strongly believe that ultimately all honest MKR holders and all honest participants in the system will vote accordingly to the scientific governance, right? Because I mean, because that's just a really you know it really provides the proof that this is the best way for you to vote because this is what all like all the data, all the models, all the knowledge that we have tells us this is how we do our best to control the system. And as a result, you know, for instance, we'll like that'll be make the MKR token the most valuable, right? Because that'll make the, the system the best in the long run, right? So I think a more interesting case that is a lot more, you know, very, very likely or like very, something that really has to be considered, right? Our governance attacks. So essentially a malicious act of buying up, let's say 51% of the MKR supply, right? So that they actually get control over the governance of the system and uh, once that happens i mean you have a pretty serious uh, situation right because someone who controls the governance of the system can actually for instance print infinite die right they can just like add some sort of total garbage made up erc20 token and then give it an infinite debt ceiling and and uh, you know just print 
you know, 10 trillion die, right? And try to cash it out. Um, so you don't want that to happen, right? Like obviously the system has to have very strong measures in place to prevent something like that from ever happening under any circumstances, right? Like it's not just, it's not enough that you just try to make it very unlikely or try to kind of like, you know, make it, you know, like remove the incentive or something to do this. You really have to, to be able to guarantee that under no circumstances can it ever happen, right? And where, like, what that leads us to is, um, like, first of all, the fact, like, the, the, the principle of security delays, right? So any sort of modification that's made to the system, such as a governance action, is always done with a very long delay to it, right? So you actually try to, like, implement the change to the system, but the, the change, the new state, doesn't go through until after a significant waiting period. And in this waiting period, this is where, you know, the, the community has a chance to protect against the tax, right? This is where there's a chance to basically, in, you know, like, and really a guarantee that as long as there's just like a very minimal level of, of honest actors in the system, um, you'll, you'll be able to completely mitigate an attack. Um, and the way that, the way it's mitigated is through what's known as the emergency shutdown. So the emergency shutdown is actually... Like, it's pretty much the most important feature of the system, right? It's the feature that guarantees you as a die holder that ultimately the worst thing that can happen to you is that the system shuts down and for every, you know, for every die you have, you're going to get $1 worth of collateral. And you can really go and you can verify this is the case in the code and you can go and you can verify that the assets are there in the blockchain and that's how you know that, okay, no matter what happens, this is going to be worth $1, right? Um, And... And that's really how all of these edge cases are handled, right? Basically, any sort of like in any sort of of, of edge case outlier emergency scenario to the system, um, the only real outcome is to shut it down and basically say, okay, we're not going to put our users at risk under any circumstances. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to allow them to gracefully exit the system at exactly the you know the net value that they're entitled to, and then immediately after doing an emergency shutdown. Um, depending on, on the circumstances in where it happened, right, you will usually be able to just redeploy and restart the system again in, re- in, in the exact same state, except you can remove whatever bad parts that caused the emergency shutdown in the first place. So for instance, if someone does a, tries to do a 51% attack, you'll, you'll do an emergency shutdown of the system and then you'll relaunch the system, but you'll relaunch it without the MKR of the attacker, right? So he get, basically gets to pay the price of getting all his MKR um, forked out of the distribution, right? Um, and everyone else, they just switch over to the new system. I mean, it's not going to, like, it's an annoyance, obviously, um, but it's actually possible to handle it quite gracefully. So for regular users, all an emergency shutdown that is is redeployed and, and ultimately um, allows the system to go on, all they have to do is just click a button on the phones, right? They just have to like click a button to upgrade the die, uh, quite similar to how they have to upgrade the die from single collateral die to multi collateral die. So, I mean, it gets more advanced than this, obviously, but this is kind of like the fundamentals of the game theory around how the governance ultimately is kept safe from all sorts of of strange edge cases. Yeah, it's very important to have a prevention mechanism in there. I mean, it's kind of like how I envision a 51% attack on proof of stake would work. Like you can just kind of, you would, you know, well, in Ether's Ethereum 2.0 case, you would slash the the malicious actor or essentially kind of fork them out of the network and end up costing them a lot more money than the damage that was actually done. So it's interesting to hear you talk through it. You know, we talked a lot about what the future holds, multi-collateral die, die savings rate, the future of the governance. What are the other things that your team's looking at? I know I've seen talk of uh, decentralizing the oracles. And also, is there plans to move someday from just being pegged to the US dollar to maybe euro die or a basket of currencies? Yeah, so so the plans for the oracles is primarily it is to, first of all, like the most important thing with the oracles is to also completely mitigate uh, the impact of malicious oracles in the system, right? So this is, and this is done with the same logic as as how malicious governance is is mitigated, right? It is by imposing a delay on the data from the oracles and ultimately reacting to bad data by shutting down the system and restarting it without the malicious oracles. Um, and in terms of like other features that's coming next, right? I mean, first of all, the main focus after launch of MCD is to really focus on security tokens and real world assets as collateral 
because that's kind of one of the most exciting things that's going to really like show you know show the world just how powerful decentralized finance is and how powerful the blockchain is once it starts actually interacting with the real world right um, and it's also what's going to solve the scalability issue. It means that DAI can now scale to trillions of dollars if it has to, um, with no problem, as long as, as it has this link to the real world and can use things like real estate, bonds, uh, and, and so on, right? And then the next step after adding all these security tokens and adding the real world assets as collateral is getting into the, yeah, like the, the frontier of synthetic assets and basically multiple um, multiple target assets, right? So instead of just having DAI that's pegged to the dollar, eventually we'll have, um, you know, all sorts of, of, of DAI tokens pegged to all sorts of assets. So we'll have, you know, Euro DAI and Yen DAI and Pound DAI and so on, right? And really, in the end, it'll, there'll be DAI that is pegged to every single currency, right? Um, and not, it doesn't end there. It goes beyond just currency. It goes to actually any type of assets. So we'll have synthetic assets for eventually literally anything, right? Stocks, bonds, commodities, anything you can think about, right? Even very complicated stuff like indices or, you know, stuff that doesn't even exist right now. Like um, like assets that are more like prediction markets really than, than actual assets in the real world, right? As long as you can produce a, a price feed for it and there, and there are people who actually want to, to trade that asset and, and use that asset as a currency or use it as some sort of speculative instrument, it'll be possible to create a synthetic version of it. And it's possible to do so with almost the exact same code base as what is used for just for the very basic um, DAI system. So once we sort of get going with that, it'll be incredibly easy for the community to just continuously deploy new synthetic assets for anything it wants to. And ultimately, all of that will be handled entirely by the decentralized governance. I say you guys definitely definitely have no lack of work on your roadmap. That's for sure. A lot of cool stuff coming. I, I've talked about this question and it just popped in my head with a couple of guests. I talked to um, Nadav from Dharma about it. Do you ever, I personally start to get worried down the road as this stuff grows and open finance is definitely not just maker. Um, but we start to introduce a lot of risk into these systems that maybe we're not aware of. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got, um, multi-collateral die going and who knows you've got someone like collateralizing a god's unchained card right into their cdp to pull out auger and there's not a lot of liquidity there it just that's an extreme example but do you ever worry a little bit about how we're going to track the risk of all this in the future not, not as long as we use best practices right and what we need to do it's quite clear what we need to do to avoid something like you know um the financial crisis right some sort of financial meltdown it, and it really it depends on two things, right? Number one is, and the most important is transparency and access to data, right? So it's very, very important to know exactly what's going on. And it's very important that everyone knows exactly what's going on, right? Not just some, you know, secret elite group or something or like special privileged people know what's going on and everyone else just assume it's going to be fine, right? Ultimately, we need complete transparency of decentralized finance in order to keep it safe. Um, because... If we have that complete transparency, then the second thing is, oh, then we just need to apply the right risk models, right? And like do, basically do the best possible effort at trying to manage the risk of this. Um, ultimately, then we can do better than what's currently going on in the financial system, right? Because the current financial system really has neither of those things, right? There's not really perfect access to data and transparency. And, and the models that are being used are not really like, you know, like the most optimal scientific models, but rather like all sorts of proprietary models used all over the place. Um, and and that's going to be the big advantage that decentralized finance has. I mean, the, the example you brought up, right? That's kind of like, that's an example of something where probably if the models and the data is used correctly, you're not really going to see a lot of, you know, like gaming cards being used as collateral for, for um, you know, like like other types of, of synthetic tokens or something. I mean, there'll be some of that, right? Because again, you can use, you should be able to use anything as collateral, um, but there just has to be very strong checks and balances on how much that can be done, right? And essentially if what the moment there's too much of a built up in, in risk in one part of the system, what you have to do is you have to, you have to basically disincentivize that, right? Which you can do either by blocking it entirely with the debt ceiling or through some sort of autonomous mechanism that just jacks up um, the interest rates as as risk builds up further. <laughs>
Yeah, I, and I think zero knowledge proofs are going to throw an interesting wrench into this and like the transparency of everything. But I guess on the system side of things, those won't be implemented. So it'll still be transparent. But like, you know, we have um, zero knowledge ERC t- uh, 20 tokens as a EIP right now, right? So like that privacy is close and coming for sure. Um, so I think just the last question I have for you is actually kind of outside of all the interest intricacies of the system we've been talking about today and it's more just about the transition to eth 2.0 someday so obviously you know come like phase two of eth 2.0 we're going to have state transitions but i think it'll be a little bit slower of a transition for some of the larger applications than people think have you had any internal discussions about the transition to eth 2.0 someday uh not really i mean it's not something we focus too much on yet something that's interesting is that it's not really like there's not really any guarantee that the Ethereum ecosystem will actually transition over to ETH 2.0, right? You could easily have a scenario where um, the Ethereum apps decide to move to some other blockchain because what's actually going to happen is just the old Ethereum blockchain will just get shut down, right? Um, And then people have to move. But it's not really that... There's not really going to be anything that's going to facilitate the move over to specifically ETH 2.0. That being said, I mean, I think almost certainly that's where all the um, the momentum will go right like unless the, the you know the technical roadmap just completely fails or or for whatever reason right um the community gets too toxic or something i mean but it almost certainly it will eventually be this like very um you know like there'll be this momentum in the community to move over and i could imagine that it will really be that uh, the, when the actual transition happens, it'll be a coordination amongst a lot of the different applications and a lot of the different, um, you know, businesses and, and ecosystem around it. And then it'll be this like big event essentially where, um, where basically the bulk of the, um, you know, the bulk of the users and the bulk of the, of the network on Ethereum will decide, okay, Ethereum 2.0 is, is ready at this point And it's time that we actually move over and then, it'll be quite coordinated in, in you know, a, a period of time where then there'll be like massive like turmoil, obviously in terms of nothing works, suddenly everything is in, is in maintenance mode and is switching over. But then from there, it'll be quite graceful, right? Because then you will have all the clout and all of the network effect now sitting on ETH 2.0. And then finally, the, the long-term outlook will be completely stable, right? Because that will go on forever. Yeah, definitely. It'll be a very interesting period once we get there. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later. But uh, I agree with you. I think it'll kind of be a coordinated move for a lot of the larger applications. Well, Rune, I really appreciate you joining me. I think this has been a great conversation and thanks for joining the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Into the Ether podcast. You can subscribe to us at podcast.ethub.io, as well as follow us on Twitter at at econoar and at zazzle0x.